This week, three sides of the coin. Robert Duncan is back talking about his Kiss book, talking about Loudmouth, talking about Cream Magazine, and a lot of talk about Blue Ice for Cold. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things Kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. Where's that third side? Well, it's two sides of the coin, isn't it? It's it's really gonna become two sides of the coin very soon. Hint, hint, God, nudge, no. nudge, it's wink, been, wink. It's just been you and I from the beginning. Really, you, know? you know, we're we are the ones that basically just <laughs> keep the ship sailing. Hey oh hey and, and this is nothing's directed towards Lisa. Because Lisa was very sad she couldn't be on our 400th show last week. But, you know, Ed, come on, Ed. You were one of the co-founders of this. He actually called me. Now, matter of fact, I felt bad because uh, we were talking. It's a couple hours ago he called me. Look, he's, look we, we say it all the time. Family, business. We're working the things family that, comes from. We're, we're giving yeah. him a hard time, people. Just yeah. for, for certain groups of you dwellers of the cesspool we're giving him a hard time and he completely knows and plays along with it. we're not really <laughs> pissed okay so yeah matter of fact we were talking then i got a business call from a guy that i put a bit in on some job he wanted me to he wanted me to actually do more work for him and it was a little out of my scope but anyways when he called i did get off the phone with tommy so um tommy's out working today you just got us two knuckleheads and uh we're going to give her a go for you. So hopefully you guys dig it. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. I mean, we've got this week, we've got um, returning Robert Duncan. And, you know, just we, a reminder. What, 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 it, yes, that, that Robert, that, that, that Robert Duncan, the, the guy who wrote the book that all of us little kiss fans back in the seventies were fucking screaming for. Yep. I Love remember mine. I remember ordering mine through Scholastic Book at school and couldn't wait for that book, that box of books the teacher would get and she'd walk in and open it up and distribute the books. Oh, couldn't wait for that book to show up. Oh goddamn Mike, something happened today. I couldn't even fucking believe it. I ordered a um a, a box set from England. And the box came here today, and it was repackaged. It looked like it went through a fucking shredder. I pull out my box set. I was about in tears. Not a fucking nick on it. I don't know how the fuck it happened. I was bitching the whole time opening it. Liz is like, "What's wrong?" I said, "I paid a hundred bucks for this." I don't have, and you know, it's got that yellow caution yep. tape like all over. The box is destroyed. And then the, there's the worst part. I reach in, and it's fucking soaking wet. Oh God! And I'm like, oh, you gotta be fine. And I paid an extra extra money to get it to the states. Matter of fact, the original ship day. I just bought this thing last week, and today's what Tuesday. Like four days from the fucking UK. That's insane. That's great. Like, yeah, I know. So I get it, and I'm like, yeah, fuck it. Not a fucking not a. Bent, I haven't even opened it yet. Not a bent fucking corner on it. I mean, absolutely pristine. And I was like, holy shit, man. I, 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 I love those moments where you get something from the, this is the post office, not, not UPS or FedEx, where you open up the mailbox and you pull out the letter and it's in like a Ziploc clear plastic oh. bag. And they put a note in there that said, we don't know what happened, but your letter was mutilated in transit. So here it is. And I'm like, how do I know what was in that envelope is still here? Because it's literally like chewed up by a dog. <laughs> yeah, I could not fucking believe it, man. I was so happy when I finally got to it. And it didn't look like it was packed with the shit, but, I, you know crazy just but not Rob, a robert duncan joins us again this week we got some kiss discussions we got a lot of cream magazine discussions and a really cool fairly deep discussion on blue oyster cult because robert robert's good friends with them 
He's known them for a long time. Mark's a huge fan. I'm not as huge as Mark, but we get into some Blue Oyster Cult minutia here. Yeah, it was, con it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. So, so let it roll. Robert Duncan talking about his new book, Loudmouth. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and Shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. So, Three Sides World, we are really proud to welcome back Robert Duncan, and it's been a couple years, I think, Robert, hasn't it? I was trying to remember, yeah, two, at least two or three, you know. Um, you know, if, if I... Maybe if I, more. If you I, know, the way if, time flies, it could be yeah, 10 years. If I did my actual, like, real show prep, like, professional, I'd know exactly the date that it was on yeah. and what episode it was. But a couple years ago, at least, we had Robert. We tracked. We were just talking about this before hitting record. We, we tracked Robert down on Facebook and was like, do you want to talk about your book? And he came on a couple years ago and talked about that amazing Kiss book the first kiss book ever written. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I went back, I was trying to remember if I, I thought, God, I probably wore my kiss tie last time. So I had to go dig it out and, and, you yep. know, uh, yep. the kiss tie my son gave me, uh, when he figured out that I had written this kiss book. And, <laughs> um, but, but so I went back to just check the tape. I should have checked what date it was, but, but I, I realized we were talking about, we were talking about that, that Hollywood Liza Minnelli party. And, um, and when, when Gene and uh, Diana Ross came to the party, I, I, I told that story. And the funny thing about that story is this guy, well, you know, this guy, Christian Blatt, who has a, a, a kiss and yep. other stuff podcast. He said, you know, Hey, I, he, he contacted me and said, Hey, I work for Dennis Miller and he would love to hear that story that you told on three sides of the coin. Uh, on his on his podcast, so uh, yeah, you were that, you, like last week. Yeah, you were just recently on with Dennis. We had Dennis Miller on here probably six months, a year ago as well. Oh, it's like over that. Yeah. Well, has it been that long? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's just funny. That. He he found me, or they found me through uh, through the through this podcast. We make people famous. We you really do. <laughs> <laughs> Looks funny. My shirt rotation was off by a week because I wore my cream shirt last week. So yeah, oh, really, come on, Mark. You, you you just don't plan that out, do you? You could have pulled out the dirty one. Nobody would have known. Well, you know what? I I do have a white one. I wore my black one. I do have a white with uh, the boy Howdy on it too. Yeah. So. Well, you, now you can get them again because because of the documentary, they're selling them. Uh, they have uh, well, you know creammag.com. It's funny you say that because they have that special issue thing coming out. But I was going not not to wave my own flag or whatever. But I was going through some pictures. I I was lucky, smart, whatever it was, because I was such a huge cream geek, especially being from Detroit. But I mean, I, I always was sporting a cream shirt. Sure. Matter of fact, uh, matter of fact, Michael, that those pictures of me from '09 front row at uh, Kiss, I'm wearing a cream shirt. And uh, I got another one from like '06. I was my, I play in a band, and I was looking. I'm like, hey, I was wearing my cream shirt that uh, that night too. So, I, you know, I, just growing up here, cream just meant the. It was funny because when I I went to the premiere. Did you go to the did, did you go to the premiere that was at in in March of '19 here in Detroit? No, I, w I wish I did. I was I was invited and I was supposed to, but I had to go. I forget. I had to go out of town for work or something, and it was like, and they kept moving it, and so I kept scheduling trying to schedule it so i'd go to it and then they moved it again and it was so let I, me tell my my wife and i went it was at the fox theater or not right. the fox theater it was at the state theater um regardless it it you know plays One of those downtown old, old cool theater. yeah it was cool seeing that film with you know a thousand i'm just under two thousand plus people yeah, they're watching that movie and one of the things and i remember when i was telling michael when i saw the movie um back then was I was really kind of apprehensive. I'm like, because, you know, I'm, I'm 55, but a good number of the people are older than me that were there. And I was like, I know Kiss is going to be in this. Are they going to get 
man, when Kit, when Gene and Paul appeared in the Destroyer album, people just erupted in cheers. And I'm like, yeah, that was cool. So, <laughs> um, you know, and it was great because uh, that's where I met Jan and we ended up getting here, her on the show. And, um, you know, um, it's funny too, because I felt so bad. She was just being like, people were just like mobbing her because they, you know, she's a big right. part of the movie and yeah. integral part of the story. And I'm like, hi, I'm from a kiss podcast. <laughs> I felt like yeah. this is little kid geek. Go, can I have your business card? <laughs> she was, uh, oh. she was well, really, cool. nice. I, you know, I want to, sh- I want to show you something really quick. Hold on. I got it. She's nice her. folks though. Uh, she, yeah. yeah, she, she really is. I'd been Facebook friends with her for a number of years yeah. and, and, had always been like politely harassing her of like, come on the show, come on the show. And she's like, well, I got nothing to talk huh? about. Let, I'm, I'm going to be working on this documentary. Can we it. wait? Can we wait? This is, a, this is a real one. This is, this is from the seventies. Yeah. I have a bunch of those, a bunch. I have three or four of those stickers. In, yeah. that go around the can. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, 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 I don't know where I got them, but I was going through some boxes one day and I, I found those stickers. Yeah. Well, R- Robert, since, since last time you were on, we talked all about your kiss book this time, yeah. let's talk more about cream. And of course your new book Loudmouth. Yeah. So yeah. b- before if only you- I had a copy nearby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's almost like you've studied under Gene Simmons there. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, when I, yeah, yeah, this is, I'm in my recording studio. And when I was kind of decorating it for, to do these, to do various bits of publicity, I was like, well, wait a second. Shouldn't I put this, I shouldn't I fill this music stand with loud mouse books? So, so yeah. yeah, and 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 just so everybody knows, I've been I've been working with Robert and helping him um, with the promotion for his book, and he's all Fantastic. arranging ar- arranging interviews and stuff, and he's always like, "Is this a video or audio interview?" Because I need to know if I need to put my rock and roll clothes on or if I don't need my rock and roll clothes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I realized I had that. I have a black and white polka dot shirt that I, I wore on your, th- your show a couple of years ago. And, and then I wore it in the cream documentary and I wore, there's another documentary called um, ticket to write that came out a little bit before that. And I'm always wearing my black and white polka dot shirt and I've done it in all these podcasts. And I thought, Oh, fuck it. I'll just, I got to send this thing out to the cleaners. This is getting a little, <laughs> a little stinky. And, uh, so then I'm, I'm, I don't have it. So, but I thought, well, I'll give you a little variety, but I'll continuity. Kiss still, got the, still got the kiss necktie. Yeah. So, um, so, 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 so tell, tell us about, tell us about your book, Loudmouth. What's, what's the, what's the story? What's the premise? The premise as if there were, it's like cream magazine. People say, Oh, what was that a plan to do all that? Well, you know, there was never a plan. And I just kind of started writing one day um, now, like seven years ago. And, and I was writing stories and, and it, it, it in part came out of people were always telling me, I oh, ought to, you ought to write down your stories, you know? And I was having a bad time. So I thought, well, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to write stuff. I don't know what it is. So it wound up, I wrote a, I just kept writing for, for like for 13 months. And, and at the end of it, I'm like, what is this shit? And some of it was stories from my childhood. And some of it was stories from, you know, at cream magazine and, and, and Lester bangs and all that. And, and, and bands, you know, hanging out with, with bands back in the day. And, uh, and, and I just thought, I thought, well, you know, if I, took this chapter out and I added a chapter over here and by way of transition, uh, this might be a whole, this might be, you know, a, a, a nice kind of linked book of short stories. And, and then I thought, well, you know, or a memoir, cause it, it, it's, it, it's very close to my life. Now I exaggerate, I exaggerate or I kind of, um, I, I hold back in some part. And, and I don't hold back from my own embarrassment. My embarrassment is fully on display in the in the book. But um, but uh, in the end, I decided. Well, um, so, so I had all this stuff, and I thought, well, all right, let's see what I can do with it. And and then I spent like four more years trying to make it uh, 
make it into um, what I thought might be a novel at first, and then I decided it would be a, a uh, I mean, I thought it might be a memoir, um, but but I got so bored writing about, well, and then I moved here and I moved there and I did this and, and it was like, God damn it, let's just leave all the boring parts out and make it a novel. So it's, it, is, it is technically fiction, but um, as, I, as I said to somebody, I said it's, uh, it's uh, some of it's factual, all of it's the truth. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it, 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 it's, it's like so those... basically it's about a guy named who the character's name is Thomas Ransom and Thomas comes from a, uh, as I do, comes from a, you know, kind of dysfunctional Southern family uh, who was wound up in New York, which was kind of fish out of water thing. And, you know, so this guy, uh, this guy growing up in the 60s, 70s is like, you know, there's just going to be the generation gap was real and it was brutal and it was, you know, way beyond, you know, just arguing. So, so, you know, in some houses it got a little violent. And uh, so eventually the, the character, uh, uh, the, he plays in band since he's 12 years old. Strangely enough, I did too. Winds up a singer in a band and they get to a level of success. And of course, like all bands, the, you know, the drummer explodes or the, or the guitar player runs off with the other guy's girlfriend or whatever the hell happened. And, and I finally got sick of all that. And I decided I would, I would try to, uh, to write about music instead, because that was something I could do all by myself. I didn't have to have a bass player. And, uh, and, uh, and just by the weirdest serendipity, I met a guy named uh, Ed Ward, who was is a was a, one of the original editors at Rolling Stone? I read, met him when I was looking for an apartment. I don't know if I told this story before, but no, I, I don't um, remember this one. Well, well, I moved out to California because I thought I'm going to get out of New York. By the way, the last thing that happened to me in New York is was the guitar player in the wonderful in Janis Joplin's wonderful original band, Big Brother and the Holding Company, um, came down to jam with me and a few other people and invited me to be the singer in his first post Janis Joplin band. And, uh, and it was like, this was like my dream come true to be a rock star. Right. And, uh, and, and I, again, I give this story to Thomas Ransom in the book, but it was my dream come true. And, but I had already made plans to go out to California, get the fuck out of New York. And I told him no, which was, I don't know if that was, so I could have been a I could have been an over the hill rock star right now instead of an <laughs> over the hill uh, rock writer. But, but but you would have never written the Kiss book. <laughs> well, maybe I would have. I don't know. But you're you're probably right. I would have. Been, I probably would have OD'd. You know. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was, I moved to California and I was looking for a cheap apartment and it was just, it was as brutal then as it, it, it is now, or it's, as it always is. And at the end of a long day and a long week looking for apartments, I saw a, a basement for rent in Sausalito. You may know the name of the town. And, um, you sure do. and it was all just up from, um, you know, <laughs> oh, Okay, you, you could tell me where it was, but um, it was a, a basement apartment, and I saw for rent sign, pull the car over, and I run across the street, and here comes a guy from the other direction and goes, forget about it, I got it already, you know, uh, and I'm like, ah, oh, shit, and I said, well, you mind if I look at it anyway, and he's like, yeah, but don't get any ideas, you know, he was like a really unfriendly cat, and uh, so... I went in the apartment and I, I'm looking around and he comes in and he's got his box of shit in his, his arms. He's moving in already. And he puts it down and under, under the, uh, under the box is a, a lanyard uh, with a, a press pass on it. And I'm like, what, why are you wearing that? You know, uh, what are you in the press? He says, yeah, you know, I'm a writer and I'm an editor. And I said, oh, yeah, I said, uh, you know, who do you, I, I'm interested in that, you know, I'm trying to become a professional writer. And I said, who do you write for? And he says, you know, Rolling Stone and uh, I forget Esquire and Cream and I'm the West Coast editor of Cream and and all these other magazines it just went on for a long time. Again, another story I assigned my protagonist in Loudmouth, but uh and it was this it turned out it was Ed Ward, this guy who was or, or, or 
original uh, Rolling Stone editor, and he was for 20 or 25 years, he was the rock historian on um, Terry Gross's Fresh Air show. Uh, he's written a couple of, you know, the history of rock and roll things. He's really kind of, everybody knows him. Um, and he's still, he's still kind of a curmudgeon, but, but he was the curmudgeon who gave me my, uh, gave me my break. He made me do a lot of, of course, a lot of slave work for him, like transcribing <laughs> tapes and all this stuff before he gave me my first assignment. But, you know, he taught me a lot. I give him all the credit. He introduced me a guy named John Morthland, who became interim editor of Cream, who then called me up, John, and said, uh, hey, you want to come be copy boy, which is kind of low, low man on the totem pole uh, at Cream. And I'm like, yeah, I'm broke. I'm living on my friend's couch. Uh, fuck yeah. So I went to Cream and, you know, pretty quickly uh, became managing editor because I believe it was because Lester Banks kept chasing. They, they, they went through a series of editors. My friend John left. He never wanted a full-time job anywhere. And then they had a, a series of other people and Lester would say, ah, I don't like that person and that. And, and so he would undermine them and refuse to kind of play along. And, and uh, eventually the publisher came to me and said, you want to be editor? And, uh, and I said, yeah, I mean, I was like a good cheerleader. I was, I was, I was good at that. You know, I, I had very little experience, but I was good at all that. And I understood the psychology of this situation. And I said, <clears throat> I said to Barry Kramer, the late great publisher of Cream, I said, uh, hey, you know, but don't make me, don't give me the title of editor. Why don't you give Lester, who was the, you know, he was our star writer and the star personality at the, at the magazine. And, and really, he really was a, a great writer writer a mad genius about music he would listen to stuff that you'd think what the fuck is that and then you know 10 years later it's 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 essential to to uh, pop music but anyways i'm i said to barry i said why don't you make him editor and make me managing editor and lester's title can just be you know honorific and you know i'll do all the the managing underneath not that I'm the world's best manager, but at least I knew how to keep it together, maybe more than Lester. <laughs> so how, that how, was how, it. You know? How difficult was it in the those early days of Cream to try and instill a little bit of, I don't know, formality, structure in a world that's led by Lester Bangs, who, you know, it, you know was, 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 was there always still a little bit of budding well, heads? The only structure was we had, you know, magazines were printed in those days. So we had printing deadlines. And by a certain day, if you wanted to be, and, and you had a circulation company that circulated the magazine. So you had to make your printing deadline if you wanted it printed in time for the, for the, the circulation company. And if you didn't have it in time for them, they might not put you out on the newsstand. So, so that was the greatest discipline was that. And I remember one, one day we went up right up to the, to the, just the end and, uh, you know, drop dead moment to get it to the printer. And, and I actually got on a plane. The printer was up in, in uh, outside Montreal, pretty far outside Montreal. And uh, I had to, I got on a plane with the, with the, with the, you know, all the layouts and um, what do you call mechanicals is what we used to call them is what the industry called them. So we t I took all the mechanicals, which were, you know, this is, we're way before electronic <laughs> shit. Uh, but I had to take them up there to the plant in Magog, Canada. And Magog, and it was the middle of a hurricane, I mean, a, a blizzard. And I, I have to drive from, I guess it was the Montreal airport, you know, an hour or two or three, uh, way the fuck out into you know, snow land, you know, you couldn't barely see the road. You, you couldn't in parts. So you had to make that deadline. And, and, and we always did. And, but before that, you know, it, there really wasn't, I mean, it was all kind of personal effort and you wanted to have a cool piece in this month's magazine. And, you know, maybe you're competing with Lester or you're competing with Jan and, um, so there was, you know, I think, and, and just, we had, a, we had a great sense of camaraderie and, 
you know, we were, we were always going out drinking every night together and we would stay out late and we're, you know, we were wild people. And, uh, and so, but there was no giant plan, you know, I mean, we, we, we try to plan, well, you know, what do we need in this issue? We got to fill whatever it was, 64 pages or something. So, so there was, the, but the, the planning was just kind of like incidental. Well, you guys are very much like a band in a lot of ways. I mean, it, you, the, the company was, you know, the, it was successful because of you crazies. And it was very much, it was funny, after watching the movie, I thought it was very much also like how the original cast of SNL was. Like, here's yeah. all these freaking misfits, but when you put them all together, it works. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it's just such a cool story. And it's, and it's so much cooler than, like, Rolling Stone or any of that other shit. I mean, Cream was the real fucking deal. I mean, I, again, that's maybe what drew me to it as a kid. Yeah. You know, also, too, keep in mind, when I was starting to get into to Kiss, you guys were also, you know, Aerosmith and Nugent. And all. I was like, right. I was like a sponge, man. And I, I couldn't wait to get it all. It was so mm -hmm. Every week, man, going down to the store to make sure I, you know, hoping Kiss was on the cover, but you know, like, hey, you know, whatever. Yeah. Here's a cool Aerosmith thing or whatever, you know. So and I, you guys got it. You guys got into Van Halen early too. The, yeah. The yeah. Did. Awesome. Oh, <laughs> uh, there was, you know, I, I think the band thing. That's an apt comparison. I think. Uh, oh, somebody like Cameron Crowe said it in, in the in the Cream documentary. Um, which everybody, by the way, should see. It's really good, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and it really, you know, it was, it, it was totally. I mean, yeah. If you if you wrote this down on paper, it's just like any good idea. If you wrote it down on paper, a good company or good, you know, things that are really cool and good and innovative, are things that if you. You know, if you tried to, to put together a business plan and go to a bank and get some banker to give you money, you would be like, are you fucking kidding me? And because you can't write that shit down, it's just, you know, it's even like, it's yeah, it's like the Beatles. I mean, how did John and Paul, you know, how did this happen, you know? And we're like Kiss. So, uh, yes, you can't, the best things in life are, not planned. I'll, I'll go out on a limb. <laughs> no, I, 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 I completely agree with that. It, you know, you can't, you can't plan the, those good things. You can hope for them, but yeah. you can't sit down and go, I'm going to make that happen because it's the stuff you don't plan right. that becomes those great things. And if you're, if you're not paying attention you won't know that it's happening to you. Does that make yeah. sense? You know, yeah. it, you'll, you'll just be like, oh, wait a second. That happened to me six months ago, and that could have been amazing, and I wasn't paying attention to it. And Yeah, you can't – you got to kind of just let life happen. Yeah, you know, it, it's just like – it's like writing or painting or playing music. It's about flow. Even in a business, it's about – flow and let you know not getting in the way of the natural flow of things and i remember when i when i you know we started i, I eventually had to make money you can't make money as a rock critic uh, i mean you can make a little bit but not enough to you know i had a couple of kids at some point it was like oh shit i gotta get oh, but a real you got job. all those free records wasn't that worth it <laughs> That well, the free records was the that was we made more money selling the free records than we did, you know, getting paid by whether it was freelancers or or being on staff with Cream. It's the funny. Free, it's 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 funny you say that because I, I I know people who this would have been back in the eighties who were A and R reps, and they were only able to survive because once a month they take their giant box of promos that they collected from all their friends at other labels and the label they worked at and they'd go to the used record store with this giant box of promos sell it and that paid their rent for the month oh yeah it, well you know the, the and, and again in in, in loudmouth there's a story about the 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 character has this there was a guy who came to my apartment and then when lester moved in next door to lester's in my apartments oh i think he came 
I think he came once a month. It might have been every two weeks. I'm not sure we could have lasted a month. Um, but we, you know, as rock critics, and, and you know, I, I really use that word critic um, uh, loosely, but we, we got, you know, you get on, you get put on the list by all the publicists at all the labels, and they, they're, they're hoping that you'll give a good review to, to whatever shitty band, and most of them are shitty. And, uh, you know, just like most books are shitty, uh, most movies are shitty, uh, but there are some great ones in there, and there's some okay ones. But anyways, this this guy Benny, we lived in a fifth floor walk up, and this guy, you know, he 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 was pushing 400 pounds, and he had to walk up five flights, at, you know, once a month. And he came, and he paid us a dollar for regular records, you know, and it was all records. There were no CDs at the time, and for instance you know, gold vinyl, or I remember when Talking Heads came out with, oh, they had some sexy vinyl thing. So he'd give you $2 for, you know, special vinyl. And, uh, and that goddamn, it was Benny that kept us alive, you know. Uh, you know, we, we, we'd still, as the character does in my book, he, we'd still slide sometimes for months on end. We happened to have a, a landlord who I think was, fascinated by all the shit that was going on up on the fifth floor of his building so, uh, uh, <laughs> so yeah yeah so so that the, oh selling the records that was it yeah i forget where we started with this thing but yeah it's just talking about life at cream yeah and uh yeah and and you know we talked about when uh you know, you're really broke and you're like, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to the bank. And that meant you were going up to Columbia Records and you're going to get them to give you a bunch of records so you could, you know, hey, and you'd go to your publicist friend and say, oh, dude, you know, can you, can you help me out? No, and they don't give a shit. You know, they got 40 million of them. Exactly. Anyways, they're, they're using the, you know, the, 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 the records are, are, are something they're charging back to the artist. So the poor damn artist is, is actually. <laughs> the, the artist was paying your rent. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> you well, know, yeah, getting, in the end, back. you know, wh like when I did the Kiss book, yes, uh, the Kiss was definitely paying my rent and uh, for a few years. Like, how did that, how did that come about, though? Like, what made you go, you know what, let me do a Kiss book. Did, did somebody talk to you about that or did well, you? They, they, they did. Well, I had, um, I was writing all the, I had, uh, I, I left cream. I think I, I'm not sure when I started writing about it. No, it was before I got the cream. It was one of the first stories I wrote. I think I told you guys about, I, I met them on their first tour of the West coast when they were an opening act and I went to interview them. It was the day Paul had gotten his tattoo on okay. his shoulder. And he came in, hey, look, he was late to the interview. And he came in and he was like, oh, look at this people and blah, blah, blah. So we all, so that was his, what's now his famous tattoo. Uh, but so I wrote about them there. I might've written about them when I was at, at Cream, but Jan, you know, kind of had the corner on Kiss at, at Cream. You know, she wrote that wonderful story about uh, going on stage with them and makeup. Yes. She talks about that in the Cream movie. Um, but when I went to New York, when I left Cream, got in a fight with Barry Kramer, not a, not a physical fight, I don't think. Uh, actually, I just left in the middle of the night. I said, fuck this guy. And, <laughs> because he was docking, you know why? Because he was docking my pay because I didn't show up for a few days. And I'm like, okay, this is outrageous. This is Cream Magazine. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, what? Yeah. You know, it, I had not a leg to stand on. The guy was totally within his rights. And he was, you know, he didn't fire me. He just like, I'm going to, I'm going to hold back your paycheck for a few days. And I'm like, well, fuck it. The, the truth was I had a girlfriend in New York and I, and I could, I didn't have a, I couldn't find a girlfriend in, in, in Michigan. So I, 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 I kind of went crawling back to the girlfriend in New York who by that time had another boyfriend. So I was completely fucked every which way. Uh, <laughs> and that's in the, that's in loud mouth too. That's, <laughs> um, but, uh, Oh shit! Well, you, you look, you know, you get me off on tangents, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what the show is about, like sitting around in a bar. Oh, so I so I wrote about when I went to New York. I, I started writing about Kiss, and because I thought, well, you know, I I try to sell magazine stories, and they'd say, eh, we don't want that. And I'd say, well, 
what about Kiss? And they'd like, yeah, 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 we want that. Because, you know, they want to put the name on the outside of the magazine and sell, sell copies. So I started writing a, so I just started abusing that notion. So I would, I wrote a lot of stories about Kiss. And I, as I kind of got a rhythm of it, I decided I would, I would write a negative story, you know, one week in one publication, because I was writing for every music publication on earth. And, and I would write a positive story the next, the next week in the other publication. And so I was just kind of, you know, and it was just kind of goofing. It's the way the Kiss book is. It's got a lot of goofing in it and uh, teasing and making fun of rock criticism and, uh, and teasing the band. Um, so I was doing that just back and forth uh, 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 stories about Kiss. And I went to a, a press party. Now, that's the other thing you, you needed to do to survive as a f freelance writer or even a staff writer was you had to sell records and you had to go to press parties. And at press parties, you got a free dinner. You know, you got a free buffet dinner. You're walking in. It's very nice. And you got free booze, which was even more important. So you could get shit faced again that night. And uh, so I went to a press party for Ozzy Osbourne. I guess it was, maybe it was his first solo record. I don't, I don't remember what it was. Well, that would have been 1979, 80, if you would have went to. Yeah, it was, must have been earlier than that. So maybe yeah, it was like like a his... Sabbath thing. And, and, and he was just the only, he was the only one there. Although he wasn't entirely there. I remember <laughs> I said to the publicist, I said, oh, I'd like to meet Ozzy, you know? And they said, uh, okay. And they took me off into a dark corner of this big kind of ballroom place. And there was Ozzy sitting on a chair, just, you know, fast asleep. And they're like, you know, Ozzy, you know, this, this guy wants to meet you. <laughs> so Ozzy, probably doesn't remember that party either, but, but a guy, a, a, a guy came up to me on the buffet line, a guy I, I, I knew kind of, he was a very nice guy. Richard Robinson was his name. And he was a, he was a record producer. He was a writer for cream, but he was also a record producer. He was kind of a, a jack of all trades kind of guy. He was into electronics, very early synthesizers and all this stuff. You know, he was an interesting guy. I, I, I guess he's, I'm sure he's still around. He wasn't, he would be, you know, he was older than me. Lester was old. a lot of people were older than me. I was I was like 21 when I arrived at Korean. And uh, uh, but he said to me, he says, hey, um, he knew I'd been writing all these kiss stories. And he, Richard Robinson and it, he produced uh, Lou Reed's first solo record, among other things. And uh, he said to me, hey, you know, this guy, this editor I know is looking for somebody to write a biography of kiss he says uh, you know can i you want to call him or something so he gave me the guy's number and i called him up the next day and uh and you know very quickly we we signed a deal and and you know and again i'm i think i'm 23 and i didn't understand how young 23 was i thought well you know i'm kind of going over the hill here so uh you know I, I, I don't know if I said this to you, but I, I, I think my whole reference point, in, 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 at least in my younger life, was I thought, well, George Harrison was on Ed Sullivan at the age of 19. So I, I always thought once you get past 19, you're like, yeah, little, even though John and Paul were a couple of years older. But uh, so anyway, so I, and then I, I did the Kiss book, you know, I was... Uh, you know, I had a lot of material I had accumulated writing all those articles and I had some interview material. I'd interviewed them several times and, um, and then I had a fervid imagination. So I, I decided, okay, I need like 16 pages over 26 chapters or whatever. I figured out how much they needed, you know, the, the contract required me to write and uh, how long a book. And so I, uh, I, uh, when I would get to, you know, I, I needed to get to my 16 pages in a day or two days. And when I would get to page 12 and I couldn't, I had no more material, I would do stuff like analyze their handwriting. And uh, <laughs> so it was like, ah, oh, fuck, I'm, I'm out of gas here. I got nothing else. Oh, let me look at this Kiss Alive cover. Aha, uh -huh. all those signatures are different. I, you know, I don't know anything about analyzing handwriting, but, but I can, you know, whatever, I can kind of get the drift. 
so I did that and <laughs> whatever, made up stories. Well, that's all, that was some of the charm of it because I just remember reading it as I was when I was a kid, and I'm like, this is funny, you know, this is it, it's interesting because you you weren't just reading. This guy was born here. This guy, you could tell you were having a lot of fun with it, and oh, I really. Cool. I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I'm so glad you said that. You know, I always thought, ah, oh, kids don't get it. I remember I got a review in the um, the big paper in Austin, the Austin American Statesman, uh, from a guy named Joe Nick Potosky, who I'm still friends with, and he uh, he said, oh, this thing is really funny. You know, he says it's it's a lot of tongue in cheek and all this stuff, and I was so happy because, you know, the book Loudmouth is funny and supposed to be funny. And I remember one of the preview, one of the uh, the review advanced reviews from one of the trade publications. Who knows who works at a publishing trade publication these days? But you know, it complained that this guy, you know, he's took every drug on in the world, and he eh, kind of had a kind of had a moralistic tone. And and I'm like, oh, dude, I'm like kidding here. You know, I'm having fun. So I'm really gratified that a kid, you must have been a genius kid. Uh, <laughs> or maybe a, a genius in, in regards to humor. So, uh, you know, I don't write anything that is not trying half the time to be funny. So, well, I mean, how, I mean, let's be real. Back in the 70s, how could you write a Kiss book and have it be just completely dead serious? You couldn't. It, because it's true. It's true. It's because true. Kit, because Kiss was not dead serious. I mean, you you look you look at what their own organization was putting out for press. Yeah. I mean, I remember as a kid reading in a magazine. Oh yeah, Gene Simmons was hatched from a dinosaur egg, and you know, you, of course, Ace Frehley's from another planet. You're like, they don't even take themselves seriously. How could you write a book and not be the same way as they are? Well. You're exactly correct, and I remember, you know, chatting with Gene, and 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 he, he got it, he got it that I was kind of joking around, and and I think he even thought some of it was funny. I mean, after all, I and we discussed this last time. I am the guy who who uh, identified him as a bat lizard, and uh, the bat lizard, yeah, yeah, and uh, so. You know, Gene got it. Yeah, Gene Gene got it. And I, I think you're completely correct. You know, you can't be doing all the stuff they were doing and be a grown man and not think, okay, this is, you know. Well, you know, and, and, and if you just think back, I mean, it was all about the mystique. You know, yeah. it, they were characters. Yeah. And they wanted to keep the person hidden. So right. how could you write a book that goes into – two chapters about how Gene, where he was born and where he was raised and what his yeah. family was like and where he went to, that's not the mystique yeah. that was created. I, it's funny because there's, there's a little bit of that in the book. You know, I thought, well, God damn it. I got to, you know, give his real name or give their real names, you know? And, but I mean, I, you know, I, are, are there any kids out there? There was no fucking Google in those days. So right. it was like, uh, how how am I going to find this shit out? You can't go in the Encyclopedia Britannica or the World Book and find out, you know, what's Gene's name? Where was he born? You know, so, hey, kids, you know, feel sorry for the old writer back in the day. You know, it was, it was well, impossible. Another reason why I liked it, though, too, because it was very, you know, cream-esque. Yeah. Because one of the great parts about reading Cream, even as a kid, I mean, right out of the gate in the letters section, were side splittingly funny. And the, the the editors, you know, the editors' response to the letters, they were always taking the piss out, of, as they say in England, always yeah. taking the piss out of everything. And I'm like, that's what I wanted. You know, Absolutely. again, you know, just to get back on the Cream thing. Circus Magazine couldn't have a movie like this day, like Hit Parader, and I'm just talking about you know your contemporaries yeah, back yeah, in the sure, sure. It didn't have the personality yeah. that Cream did, you for know, sure. because if you remember in the late '70s, Circus started to want to be Rolling Stone. They started doing the no nuke stuff and all. Because I was a, I was a subscriber then, and I remember yeah, yeah. going, no, 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 because I was a subscriber to Cream too. And I'm like, no, you should be do like what Cream did. 
Cream was talking about the Ramones and shit. I, that's what I wanted. I didn't yeah. fucking give a shit about nukes and all that. I wanted to read about rock and roll. You know, if I wanted to read about fucking, you know, shit that Rolling Stone had, I'd go buy Rolling Stone. But I hated Rolling Stone. It's funny, when I went to New York from Cream, when I left Cream, the publisher of Circus asked me, um, did I want to be the editor of Circus? And I, I turned him down. Like I turned down my rock star friend. <laughs> I turned him down because I thought, well, yeah, hey. Well, first of all, I knew that Circus was a little bit duller. But I thought, well, I, and I think maybe he thought that I could change it, make it more exciting uh and uh but i thought well i'm moving on to bigger better, better things now you know i'm going to be a, a world famous novelist and that was you know that was about um a dozen years ago or maybe a dozen decades ago so finally got my first the loud mouth is my first novel even if it is close to real life and and by the way the the you know, I've had, we had, I got a great review in the San Francisco Chronicle for Loudmouth yesterday. And the guy <laughs> referred to, um, he says, well, if it seems like hyper realism, he says, and emphasis on the hyper. And I thought, that's it. That's my writing style. That's been my writing style before I got to cream. That's, that's why I was suited to cream because I kind of like, eh, you know, I, I wrote, um, Sometimes it was slow and painful, but it was always like a maniac. Um, and uh, and apparently I still do. I've seen this in a couple other reviews where they they say, uh, "Oh, this is this Gonzo style." And to me, it's just that's just the way I write. I I'm not trying to be Gonzo style or yeah. I I mean, or, as 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 a rock fan and as somebody who grew up through the Cream era and everything else and Kiss, your style is just like what's expected that's what i was expecting it is something rock and like roll that on the page. It, rock yeah it's it, exactly it's rock and roll yeah. it's not going to be a new york times well research well whatever you know it's, oh hell it's, no it's rock and roll people you you get up you raise your fist you puke a little bit and you, and you, you don't know, have to learn your scales yeah and, it, uh, <laughs> it, 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 you know, I, it's, it's funny when people do get critical on stuff like that. It's like, do you realize what you're reviewing? First of all, you're reviewing a rock and roll book, right? Right. A rock and roll book by the guy from cream magazine. Right. What more do we need to say to frame what this is going to be like? You know, yeah. it, 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 it's funny. I just think, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of people that don't, don't get, never got cream. Never got it, yeah. never understood it, you know, because it was definitely a different beast than circus, than it was, his parade. It, it was, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was, it was so, it was so, you know, I remember looking at it as a kid going, you know, we were, you, Mark, you were showing the, the cream beer can. Now, yeah. we all know now that's just a sticker wrapped around yeah. but i remember specifically remember as a kid going are those real beer cans are, yeah. do they have real beer cans that they're giving out and, you know it's that you get spi rock stars saying that it's too. the spinal tap moment of like spinal tap it's set everybody says spinal tap is fake but is it really fake are they just reverse psychology me you know it's like yeah. it's really real you know that that's what cream kind of had going forward is you didn't quite know if it was a legit claim or if it was a rock star claim. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, photo captions and the tape. You know, I, what I loved was, and, and boy, this had a lot to do with Lester because he had this boundless energy and imagination. And it wasn't, and it wasn't even fueled by drugs. It was just he had a great imagination and was a great writer. But he would, you know we would labor over and i think the model was in the 60s esquire magazine was kind of like this but we would really labor over like the table of contents what it said about each story oh, in the yeah, they were uh, funny in and, there and, yeah and they would even there would be kind of a dialogue among the different uh, the descriptions of stories in in the table of contents and and you know we were always going for the joke and and you know 
one of the things that that I, I thought was really instructive to, to me when I when I think about rock and roll was the you know the saxophone was one of the early instruments in rock and roll you know you hear it in coaster songs and all that and if you think about it it's kind of a comic instrument well you know the saxophone was actually invented in like 1880 by a guy named Adolf Sax and he invented it to be a novelty comedy instrument and I thought well that's just perfect so early rock and roll embraced it and and because the, you know it would it's partly about you know, it's about getting in people's faces in a funny way. And later became getting in people's faces and, you know, in a more of a revolutionary or, or you know, uh, confrontational way. But but I always thought, wow, the saxophone is kind of like emblematic of the origins of rock, you know, a comedy instrument. Well, you know, having a sense of humor is so important in, in life in general. And I, I, again, that was something that drew me to cream, like I said, again, the contemporaries didn't have that. And matter of fact, not only did they not have it, they weren't even fucking interested in it. Cream, like you said, they put it right in the fucking masthead. They don't yeah, give a they shit. Yeah, they look down on it. The the the, the uh, our competitors look down. Yeah, on it. the first, the, you know, the, the pretentiousness and all that. And it was funny because in the in the in the movie, I, I think it was Chad Smith, another fellow Detroiter. Who just did that whole thing? Is like Cream was like, "Fuck you," oh, and, was, and that was oh that's what it was, you know. And it was, you know, also too, just being a kid, <laughs> those little tiny things. Sometimes, like they'd sneak like a boob shot in there of like uh, uh, Grace Slick or Grace or Wendy Williams or something, just something, you know, because it was they yeah. knew that there was a bunch of teenage boys fucking <laughs> reading this yeah. stuff. You know what I mean? It was. Well, it, it was just so fucking cool. Yeah, I think it just, you know, I'm not even sure anybody ever thought, well, as teenage boys, it was just, they're, you know, the, like I was 21. I was, I was two years past teenage when I was working there. So we weren't more much older than teenage boys. And in our brains, we were, we were as young as any, as the youngest teenager. We were, just, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, so true. You guys celebrated all the loud, you know, Iggy and you know Stooges and and, and you know yeah. and MC Five. It was all that. Again, just growing up here too. It was just part of living here. Um, but you know, to see the the local guys, you know, in the national magazines, it was it was cool. You know what I mean? That was. I mean, th that has so much to do with the spirit of cream. That's part of the kind of. Uh, secret sauce it was you know okay a bunch of wild personalities but also um, the Detroit area you know the the, tr the greater greater Detroit um, it, it was just you know when I first got to Detroit I, I was coming from New York and I had never been and they and Lester and and Eric and I uh, know uh, Lester and John Morthland picked me up in Lester's like funky falling apart Camaro full of dirty socks and and jack-in-the-box wrappers and uh and we went you know they picked me up at the airport and we went straight to Pasquale's bar on Woodward Avenue to uh to get drunk which we do a lot and uh and you know and I thought and as I the, my first few weeks there I realized god Detroit is different Detroit has its own distinct personality its own distinct culture and it reminded me you know there's not many cities that have that there's like new orleans has that and uh or you know it's lost a lot of it but with the, a lot of it's been wrecked by tourists but new york had it at a t at a time before it just became a, a disneyland for rich people but but there's some very few that had had personalities san francisco maybe in the summer of love era that was a it had a distinct personality and um and detroit had one and 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 that personality that's the other writer on the cream team is the is detroit you know i agree that I agree. Attitude, and when i was living in new york and i would uh, i would uh, i like i take the subway down i did, went to college for a year or two and i would be the only place I ever saw Cream Magazine was on the on a, in a newsstand on the uh, platform at the Astor Place uh, pla uh, subway station, and I remember looking at it from afar. I, I wasn't going to pick it up because I looked at this thing and I thought, 
what the fuck, Iggy? And the MC5 on the cut, I, you know, and then Grand Funk Railroad. I have a tirade of like this in, in, in Loudmouth, or I give it to the, to the protagonist. And I'm like, that's not, that's not music, that's Detroit. What the fuck? You know, <laughs> what, what are these guys kidding? And um, so, you know, from afar, I was horrified by Cream. I thought, this isn't, this isn't, you know, and I was such a, uh, you know, snobby New Yorker at the time. I'm like, only, the only cool shit that ever happens, happens in New York. So, you know, I, I later came to understand that, yes, I, I saw the error of my ways and accepted Iggy Pop as my Lord and Savior. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, there's a reason that, that you know, when you, you can call it Detroit, but I, I and although I'm a Detroiter, I, I, I call it more the Midwestern feel. I, I think that's the reason, especially loud, heavy rock, Kiss, yeah. Aerosmith, you know, Bush, or Call Cooper, you know, Definitely. all that stuff. The well, Midwestern kids ate that shit up, man, and we still yeah. do. I mean, yeah. that that loud heavy rock because that's one of the things i liked in the cream documentary they were like you know at the time in the early to mid 70s you know rolling stone was trying to sell everybody on james taylor well that's not what kids didn't want james taylor we wanted things things we wanted things that went boom you know one of the guys spitting blood and the guy swinging on the vine and the guy cutting his fucking head off that's what we wanted and that's what we got you know and yeah. and Cream helped celebrate all that, you know. Well, I, I, I think you're right about the Midwest, and I think, and but but I think, I would argue that the beating heart of that whole thing was Detroit, but the the blood circulated out to you know, uh, you know Minnesota and and uh, and uh, Wisconsin. Oh, for sure. I was actually born in in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, so. I'm uh, and, and spent my earliest years in the Midwest, so I consider myself an honorary Midwesterner. Robert, do you do you think do you think what made Cream happen? Everything we've been talking about here, do you think that would work today? If that same attitude was brought together, could it could it happen ever? Or was it was it only perfect for that moment and that place? I think it could happen any time and and people have made a point about well it was sexist and it was uh it was this and you know well you know it didn't mean to be sexist and it was of its time and all that and i'm not not defending any of the offensive stuff the magazine did which I, i'll defend some of it though uh i mean in part it was meant to be offensive but i i think you know i think you get the right personalities you know when when I, I I had to get a job and I worked at ad agencies and all this stuff and eventually I got fired, and and I'm like I'm not gonna go work for a fucking ad agency again. Fuck, you know fuck these guys they were you know it was just it kind of grossed me out, and uh, and and so I started my own company, and with a with you know I the guys the guys who I hung out with I was I was like a, a little bit older at this point and I'm and and I had some experience but I was always hanging out with the guy in the mail room and the the you know the the youngest guys because we could listen to music and play music and you know and and get drunk and be stupid uh and you couldn't do that with some of the 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 uh the older folks or the folks that were my age and so I started my own company and I remember, and, and it was like, we were like, we're just going to make this loose. We're going to do anything media wise we, we want to do. We're going to do, you know, we're going to do movies. We're going to do music. We're going to do, we'll do ads. We'll do content before people were doing anything called content. And, uh, and, and I remember, so, so we, and we had some success. I mean, it took, a, took quite a while, but, but it, it, uh, and it, now it's been going for 30 years, but, uh, it, it, I remember a guy came up to to write about us. He says, you know, this place is just different. What's what's the deal on this place? You know, what's your thought? What's your philosophy of running it? And I said, I said, it's uh, to me, it's just Cream Magazine in, in a different, you know, milieu. And I, I said, I run it like Cream Magazine, which is not running it much at all. You know, you let people you know, you let people have their head and be creative and be imaginative and, and on all that stuff. So I think, 
you know, I think we were, and to this day, people, people go up there and they'll, they'll say, hey, this place seems really different. You know, we had a bar in our, in our, we still have a bar uh, in our, in our offices and all this stuff. So I, I think that that was, uh, that, that was a manifestation of the, that could happen anytime in any place and you just got to get the right personalities you know and it's good if you have kind of a ramrod personality or you know i i, I was i was both um intense and wild at the same time it's kind of an odd combination but so yeah i think it could happen today and, and 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 it will happen today and maybe it is happening today and we just don't know about it uh because we're so damn out of it well, do you, I, you know, I'm almost wondering, do you think people are looking back going, how do we, how do we create the cream ver, uh, uh, how do we create a website that is like what cream was? Uh, you know, are, are there people who are kind Modeling? of going back? Yeah, well, kind of going back to what we first talked about, how you can't plan stuff out in life. It sort of just happens. Yeah. Do you think there are there are some executives somewhere going, well, you know, we could revive our website if we kind of figured out that cream attitude and we brought that into what we're doing now. And, well, you know, I, are people trying to do that and, and, and mistaken and thinking that's what it is all about is just let's, let's I have no find doubt. that formula? I have no doubt that people are trying to do shit like that. They're always trying to do shit. You know, there's all those those books about, you know, uh, about your left brain and or a whack upside the head and all this stuff is like, you know, it doesn't come from a book and you can't, you can't commoditize the real thing. It, the real thing is just the real thing. And, and the real thing does what it does, you know? So, I mean, uh, because, because there, there wasn't, you couldn't sit down and write, here's the formula to no. cream success. There, no. there, there, there wasn't anything. It's, it's sort of like a whole bunch of strange ingredients that got thrown together in the right mix with the right opportunities, with the right bands and the right music at the right location. And it happened. And, and, and I, I would love to see something like cream happen again. Yeah. I just don't know if it could because people wouldn't approach it naturally. People are going to try and approach it analytically yeah and yeah, try that, and just recreate think, it i'm 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 anti-analysis <laughs> maybe because i flunked math every year in high school you know or in, in, in all through well in high school for sure uh, <laughs> and uh yeah i just think you know i i completely agree with you i don't think you can do it but i think there are people out there doing it a guy a guy wrote me recently oh a guy I, I did an interview on his podcast and he wrote me and said oh i i really uh, enjoyed you know chatting he was a cream fan he's from canada uh, you know we'll, we'll let that slide but uh and he he said you know i gotta tell you he says you inspired me to start a magazine and he just wrote me today and said first issue's coming out in october and he's he's doing a um a Saskatchewan focused magazine uh, yeah, about music in, in Northern Saskatchewan. I think it's even Northern Saskatchewan, Sask Saskatoon. And it's called, oh, the North NSMZ, uh, North Saskat Saskatchewan or North Saskatoon music zine. And, you know, an online thing, but he's, so that guy, he's just some maniac in Canada who just couldn't help himself. So those are the people you need to. Uh, yeah. I was going to say that, that that's more exciting when someone says you inspired me Yeah, because the inspiration is again, that's not something you can analyze and figure out what is exactly the inspiration that's needed to make it work. Because I mean, let's just look at the cast of characters that made up cream magazine. Yeah. That in itself, just the people and their personalities were yeah. so critical that yeah. you don't have Lester Bangs. I mean, yeah. you, I mean, how do you, how does Cream Magazine even exist without Lester Bangs? Well, I mean, that there's a, you know, it won't be, it might be North Saskatoon Music Zine, you know, uh, NSMZ, right? Um, 
it might be that, you know, and they might have their, they might discover their own Lester. Their, their own version of Lester. I mean, Lester was a guy living in El Cajon, California, which is kind of a suburb of uh, San Diego. And, you know, working in a, <laughs> working in a shoe store and, uh, you know, uh, Lester was nobody, you know, but he was compelled to write. It, the stories, I, I don't know if you ever read the biography of, of him, the De Regattas thing, which I, I think is good. Um, and he, I, I don't know if he put this story in, but I remember uh, Lester's cousin, and it might have been at Lester's funeral, telling telling how Le there was an abandoned house like nearby, next door or something to where they hung out or where his apartment was. And Lester used to go in there and write on the walls and eventually covered all the walls of this place with his ranting and raving and you know that's a guy who's driven and yeah and you know i boy i, I wish there were pictures of that house i'd love to see that you know and what, so. what 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 do you think lester would think of the music industry the music business the music in general that's happening now well, he would be contemptuous of the business. He was contemptuous of the business back then, you know, so that would be just a running thing. And he would hate most music like he hated most music of the day, <laughs> but he would pick out certain things that the rest of us hate that we think is, oh, that's just shit. You know, maybe he would pick out like BTS or something, he would do some K-pop group and, and he would say, oh, no, this is the, this is the shit. This is the real shit. And everybody think he was kidding. And, and, and maybe he was, but I'll tell you, you know, five or 10 years down the line, it would wind up being, you know, that he was right. And I don't know if he was right because he drove, drove the rightness. You know, he was right about Lou Reed. He was like, he was on, he was all about Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground really early before other people were people didn't know who, who they were and you know um and you know it's hard to imagine modern music of a certain kind without the velvet underground or lou reed so he was right about that and i remember when uh, the lou reed's album of uh, four sides of feedback came out metal machine music maybe it was six sides and lester was like oh this is great you know <laughs> Now that that didn't really pan out, but you know, Lester <laughs> on much. But he used to put it on in the fucking office, and you're trying to work, but you got to be cool. You can't say, "Will you turn that shit off, Lester?" And, but you know, another band he was on to, and I went with him to interview them on their first tour of of the U.S. And it was was Kraftwerk, and he would he would play the first Kraftwerk album, Von 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 Nocciato Von, and it was like this kind of monotonous, monotone. Um, you know, kind of electronic. It would just did it just didn't do anything for me. But Lester, and it, even I thought, okay, he's kidding. He's oh, this is the greatest. And um, so we went down and interviewed the two guys in Crawford, Rolf and Florian, and they were staying in a. They were kind of they were we interviewed them. They were wearing their like string ties and jackets and you know black suits, and they were. And they were staying in a very kind of sparse hotel, you know, like with wooden, just, just un, barely decorated in wooden chairs. And, and they were like, uh, they talked about the, they wanted to be the man machine. You know, they were German. And anyways, Lester, and, and then, you know, 10 years later, it's like, oh, uh, craft work is the foundation of so many uh, the, the 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 beat for a lot of uh, hip, hip hop stuff and and you know craft work uh, craft work gets all sorts of props mm -hmm. these days and uh, it you know so he would have liked something that we all thought was stupid and worthless and either it would have come true that it wasn't stupid or worthless or he would have made it come true. <laughs> So. Well, as, as, as a writer, what did it feel like when you championed a band that was new, upcoming, unknown, and a few years down the road, 
they break through and they get successful. What kind of feeling do you have when it's like, yeah, you know, I championed those guys. I was behind them. I, I was the littlest bit maybe of what helped them succeed. I'm tr- I, it seems like the, you know, I remember the, the a band called the dictators and the dictators were, you know, people, People will dispute this, but it's the truth. Big Dictators did the first punk record, you know, a year before the Ramones did did their first record, and 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 Sex Pistols, and and the Dictators. Um, I could just was, you know, Handsome Dick Manitoba was their yeah, lead mm-hmm. player, and they were. And I was just talking to him today, in fact, and uh, he, we chant. I championed, and Lester championed, and we. Cream champion the shit out of those guys, <laughs> and yeah, it didn't work. So well, Mark came, went on to play uh, in Twisted Sister, the bass. Exactly, yeah, Mark the Animal. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, he was like he he didn't arrive till the second album. Correct. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I knew Mark, and uh, and Ross the Boss went on to Man of War, and uh, so you know. Uh, but the, but you know the, the dictators didn't happen. So that was a, an example of a band I championed and Cream championed. Really, just just did everything we could. We just loved the dictators, and and it was because it was of the humor. You know, Andy Chernoff, who wrote the songs, was really funny. Is still a really funny guy, and he those songs are funny. And and Manitoba was a funny singer, and. Uh, it, it was great. I'm trying to think of somebody I championed. I mean, I wrote about Kiss early on, and they became huge, but but I don't know that it had anything but a, you know. I re- you know, a band that was huge that you guys were merciless, though, was Rush. Rush. Because yeah. I was a big Rush fan yeah. um, growing up. And they were in cream a lot, but you guys just tore the shit out of them all the time. Which <laughs> well, I, it was funny because you you put them in the magazine all the time, but it was always negative. Well, you know, I think I think um, band, a, a band like Rush, which you know, I I characterize them as as prog, right? Prog metal, maybe. Mm-hmm. Can I yeah. say can I yeah. say prog in relation to well, oh, prog? Sure. Prog was not. You know, it's cream. If 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 cream hated any genre and there's in, in the, in the cream movie, there's a, a clip of uh, Lester talking about Emerson Lake and Palmer mm-hmm. and how they're the worst thing ever. So, you know, and I, I kind of agreed. I mean, and I, I had, I saw Emerson Lake and Palmer open for somebody at the Fillmore East. And I just was like, what the fuck is this pretentious, pretentious bullshit? So I think, you know, and technique for the sake of technique. I mean, we were, I was, and it just happened to, again, it happened to align with what Lester was and then what the magazine was, was I, I liked it much more raw. And I, I liked people who didn't know so well how to play. I didn't, you know, I didn't want a guy who knew 17 different scales and, and all that stuff. So that's the, the prog thing was what, what uh, probably gave Rush, uh, you know, assigned them to the, to the, to the corner uh but uh god but and, and and of course you know um the guy's voice getty lee was a getty lee yeah getty lee, his voice yeah. was you know was an acquired taste but it's funny there i'm thinking it reminds you reminded me of another band i uh i championed which was a, a band produced and managed by sandy perlman who produced and managed and and created basically blue oyster, blue oyster cult and um but it was called pavlov's dog and they were out of um st louis so they were you know solid mid- midwestern guys and they had a singer with uh, uh david Surcamp who had that kind of helium voice um but they were a kick-ass band they were and they were really hard rocking band they were um you know loud and they gave you a lot of boom mark and uh, I gotta check them out. I, I've heard the name. I'm familiar with the name. I don't yeah. own any. And they did well when they were first signed. This is this is inside baseball. When they were first signed, uh, they were signed by ABC Records. ABC used to have a record company, and um, they were signed by ABC Records for the record amount ever paid in advance, which at the time was $600,000. And it was like $600,000. It was unbelievable. And, and ABC put out uh, records, put out this, their first record. And 
and and Sandy with his with Blue Oyster Cult, they were on Columbia, and Columbia, I guess, freaked out or some boss over there said to the A and R guy, "What the fuck? You let ABC Records get the greatest band ever? You gotta you gotta do something about this." So Columbia bought out their contract about two weeks after their first record came out and reissued the, that first record right away on the Columbia label. So talk about weird. Uh, and that's got to be one of the weirdest things in, in the in the music business. But but uh, but, you know, so they were they were anticipated to, to be great. And their first two records were great. And then. You know, Columbia, I guess, lost patience or something. But they, well, you know, another couple bands that Cream was in with, because that's that's how I got into them was was the Runaways and uh, like Mott the Hoople. I oh. love, well, I, but love neither them. one of those bands got huge. You know what I mean? Uh, they always kind of just stayed bubbling under because, again, both those bands are just magic. I, yeah. I love those. Oh, I love Mata Hoople. I really love Mata Hoople. I, love I don't know how they didn't get. Well, I, I still think had Ronson, had they g- given it another go with Ronson, it, I think I think it would have taken off. But I tell you what, speaking of great rock books, have you ever read Diary of a, of a Rock Star, uh, Ian Hunter's book that came out in the early seven, mid yeah. 70s? That's no, a cool book. I, I have not, and I should, because I know I you know I've heard only great things about it, and I know he's a smart guy. I never met him, but I, but um, yeah, I remember talking to I'm I'm friends with uh, Eric Bloom from Blue Oyster Cult, and and he wrote a song with Ian Hunter. And, yes, uh, that's on. Uh, I I'm a huge BOC. It's fan. on Specters. It's uh, yes, going um, to the motions. Oh. It's yes, a, which and it should have been a hit. I know. I I agree. I it agree. should have been a hit. My my wife designed the the uh, the cover for Spectres. Really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. In, in fact, in fact, when I was tricking out my studio to to be a video studios, I I asked her. I say, hey, loan me your gold record. I'll put it down there. She's got gold. <laughs> record. The gold record in the corner is for Spectres to, to for to her for designing it. Uh, so they uh, just put a matter of fact, Mike, you bastard, you got an advanced copy. I just bought the the new BOC, and I saw them uh, end of 2019. Uh, they played a, a, a club here in because I again I love that band. The fact that there's that Eric and and uh, and uh, and Buck are still putting fucking great music out, you know. No, I, that that to me that's the coolest thing is the fact that somebody like Blue Oyster Cult is still recording and releasing new music. I it, I don't care if it only sells a hundred copies. Right. God bless you guys. You're doing what you want to do. You're releasing. Yeah. yeah. By the way, Kiss fans, if you're not, if you do not have some Enchanted Evening, the 19, I think it's 78 live record. It's only a single. That yeah. album is every bit the equal of Kiss Alive. I mean, some Enchanted Evening is just so effing great that get that right or if you have spotify or whatever you do for oh i have it i i have it <laughs> i'm just no i'm just saying for our for our viewers because oh, we got well, a lot of viewers, viewers, yeah right? oh shit um, yeah, yeah because that's a great inter- matter of fact i there's another band because on your feet or on your knees is just uh, fucking insane. That that's album's my cool. that's my live record of Blue Oyster Cult. I love oh, it. it. Let me tell you, uh, the Dizbusters version on that into Bucks Boogie is just yeah. Like uh, the guitar playing is just savage on that. It's just yeah. fantastic. Yeah, great band, great band. Well, he's, and, and and Buck Dharma, uh, Donald Roser, Donald Buck Dharma Roser is one of the greatest guitarists in the history of rock. Yes. Um, I mean, he's just really up there in the top five, and uh, under the radar, I, unfortunately. Pardon me. Under the radar, though. He he is. He's 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 underrated, and I have a really great uh, musician friend who's like. He, he, I told him we were talking when I first met him. We were talking. He said, "I said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm friends with Buck Dharma because so so I I knew him from writing about him from Cream and my wife." Um, my wife uh, had known them even before I did. So she, uh, she, her boyfriend was Richard Meltzer, who wrote a bunch of their lyrics. And so they all shared a house out in Long Island before they were even Blue, Blue Oyster Cult. So she lived with them. 
Um, but uh, when when I so so we got to be great friends with him, and we when we got married, um, you know, uh, Buck and uh, uh, Alan Lanier and a bunch of them came to our wedding along with the dictators in my. <laughs> my in-laws little tiny cottage out in Coney Island. And, and they're very kind of, they were, you know, fairly conservative. All, people. New York guys. Fairly conservative people. And so, you know, we just had crazy shit going on. And, um, but I remember, to, so, so we went on our honeymoon uh, uh, with the Blue Oyster Cult. Uh, uh, and our honeymoon was like delayed about a year, but, but Sandy Perlman, who we were also friends with, uh, uh, said, hey, you know, you guys want to go to, we're going on a European tour. You want to go? go? And originally he was going to let us fly for free in the, you know, they had to charter a jet. This is when they had their lasers and shit, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> so, and we were going to fly in the um, cargo plane. And I remember thinking to myself, could I handle flying to Europe with no windows? I mean, I didn't know what a cargo was. I didn't know if a cargo plane had windows or not. But we wound up going all around Europe with the, the Blue Oyster Cult and uh, and hanging out and, you know, getting drunk and carrying on and meeting all sorts of crazy people, including that was when Sandy was talking to The Clash because he wound up producing the first American release of The Clash, Give Him Enough Rope. And The Clash came to an after party uh, for the Blue Oyster Cult in London, and uh, you know, set off a set off smoke bombs in the uh, in the room where everybody was. They were you know being bad boys. So, um, but Buck Dharma, one of the great guitarists, <clears throat> he just sounds different than almost everybody. It's kind of, it's it's still blues based, but it's it's also not. He goes off in in in, in different directions. I don't quite understand well, it. I, I tell you the, the, he's so clean with his, his tone and his playing, and he never does the hammer-on stuff. Yeah. His, he's just got such great, again, seven screaming disc busters. That, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. that's not even the lead. That's the fucking part behind the chorus. The right. I'm like, this fucking guy is phenomenal. You know, what, when, go ahead. I was just saying, in one, in one, in recent years, I, 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 see, I still see him whenever they come around. We, we see him. Buck promised me he would do a, uh, a blurb for my book, you know, one of those things is a great book, and I sent him the book, and he was all about it. What the fuck happened, Buck Dharma? Uh, <laughs> I never got my blurb. I bugged him a little bit, but eventually, I knew they had the record coming out, and I thought, oh fuck it, I'll let him leave him alone. But uh, I saw him a few, couple years ago, and and it was, you know, it was a nothing nowhere gig, you know, it was, uh, and he played like just a man on fire it was so and i said to him afterwards i said dude how how do you keep it up for 40 years how do you how do you play with such fire for 40 years he says well i feel it i love it this is this is how i express myself he says you know so he was that wasn't just a show he wasn't just you know this guy has plenty of riffs that are he's done a million times that he could just kind of repurpose but god damn it he's still feeling the fire yeah, I always tell people, again, because we have a lot of younger fans on this yeah. show, you know, explore more than, you know, Don't Fear the Reaper and Godzilla. Go back, again, those live records. There's a reason why those live records are so important, because they were such a live band. And those songs, much like Kiss, because that's the, the thread with me. Right. Kit sounds better live. Blue Oyster Cult sounds better live. Ted Absolutely. Nugent's better live. All these bands are be Aerosmith better. You know, I love that yeah. raw, and especially those '70s records. I mean, they didn't have the fucking Pro Tools. They didn't edit them where they right. shit. They they just you know it was just loud live rock. It was just yeah. you know incredible. And and, and Blue Oyster Cult is a great great example. And also Michael. Um, when does that record come out? I, I've already bought it. It just October got... Yeah, I think it's just it? in the next next couple of weeks. Yeah. yeah, three days after my book. So he, you know, so. <laughs> oh, good. good. Buy, well, buy, uh, buy the book, then go buy Blue Oyster Cult and listen to Blue Oyster Cult while you read the book. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's the only way to that's to enhance your experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it, you know, we 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 talked about this on a on an episode a couple months ago, Robert. But we were talking about how 
bands from the 70s coming into the MTV era was a challenge. And I think, Mark, you had mentioned, by example, Uriah Heep. There, there's, a, there's a great sounding band, but when video era hit, it was like a band you were like, oh, my God, what am I looking at? And yeah. I kind of feel like Blue Oyster Cult fell into that as well. It's like it's an incredibly talented band, great live, great music, everything else. But the visual of the people in the band didn't live up to the new video generation. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, you know, and they were, you know, they weren't clown. I mean, Eric Bloom could knew how to kind of clown and play, you know, kind of a, a bad, scary man, but, you know, but they weren't clowns. They didn't, they weren't clowning around. They were more of a serious band. They were musicians. I, I think you're absolutely right. And they were, you know, they're very unpretentious people. So, you know, the, I think they didn't have it in them to, to, to put on, you know, a, a real total act. They yeah. weren't an act. They were a, a band, a musician. They, they were a bunch. I mean, and you, you can see this if you really look at some of the bigger bands from the 70s and what did they end up doing in the early 80s, especially once MTV started. And you're like, oh, my God, you know, those old mustaches, you know, the, the, the one guy's really tall, another guy's really short, another guy's really big. All the things that as you moved into the video era, the labels were like, uh 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 we've got to get everybody with the right hair the right looks they got to be right height and everything else yeah. and you know as we all now looking back you know that put the music behind you it wasn't as yeah. important anymore I, I tell you what the robert what do you think i always i think i even use this example because burning for you was huge and that was early on mtv but Take Me Away is 10 times, in my opinion, 10 mm -hmm. times better. That was off the next studio record. Didn't do the business shit that, you know, Burning For You did, but Take Me Away. Yeah. I, how did that song not become bigger than Burning For You? I think it's a way better song. And that's well, kind of, you know, I love Burning For You, but, uh, and, 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 and that, I, I know um, that was a Richard Meltzer written song. And argue about, talk about great idea. lyrics throughout. I mean, yeah. you gotta that's I, the I you, just because I'm a geeky blue oyster cult fan. You really gotta. I just went out this week actually. What's the, the song off of uh, uh about the fighter planes, the Nazi planes? Um, I mean, uh, yes, yes, there's a there's a YouTube video that talks how that that plane. Because I didn't know that. I just dig the tune because it's a hard rock and great tune. But, you know, the lyrics are really from a, the German pilot point of view, which is, yeah. you know, I talk about, you know, totally freaking fucked up in some ways. But it was cool checking that out. Like the, the whole line about, you know, like heavy hanging, like heavy metal fruit. Those planes were really destructive, but they were slow. So the so the fucking allies could pick them off, you know what I mean? Yeah. But you just didn't want. I, again, that's what I mean. Talk about great lyrics. Yeah, they had you, depth, you know, and, oh, and, and Sandy Perlman wrote a lot of the lyrics for him, and he was a big sci-fi guy, and and uh, you know that when they did that, when they did when Blue Oyster Cult did Imaginos, that record was really a Sandy solo record, and. Uh, you know, so Sa Sandy died about three years ago, and then he had a brain aneurysm and uh, and uh, and died. He lived out you? by us. We were we were close friends, and so we became when he was in the hospital for like the last nine months of his life, we were his guardians, and which was really uh, n not a fun thing. And the band, you know, gave a bunch of money up, but. And then when he finally died, he had he had he had some distant cousins who were his cousins, and they said, um, so they called called me up and said, you know what what do we put on his tombstone? So um, I went through a whole bunch of Blue Oyster Cult lyrics. I thought <laughs> you, 
I got to put, you know, one of his lyrics on there. And now, God damn it, I got to remember what it was. Um, but so he has on his tombstone, he has a, um, um, I, it's from astronomy. The song oh, astronomy. I, I was just about to say, I, I was not, cr the, speaking of Imaginos, I, I, astronomy is one of my favorite Blue Oyster Cold songs. One of the I'm best. Not cr I still like the original version better yeah. than uh, Up Temple. I, I mean, don't remember, Imaginos is brilliant, yeah. but. There's something, and by the way, for the younger fans, also Metallica actually covered astronomy. Right, right they did. Yeah. What a, that song? Matter of fact, I was talking about the live record earlier. Uh, uh, Some Enchanted Even, a great live version of Astronomy on on on, on that album. Yeah, I yeah. love Astronomy. Oh yeah, just phenomenal. Again, uh, I could sit in BOC all day with you, but uh. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the lyric is if you, you could look up the lyrics. It's it's um it's uh uh singing songs, it's either singing oh, oh, songs that oh, no one oh, has ever heard right or something, the songs oh, that no one has ever heard or singing and 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 that you know I I, I never got it. We haven't been back since he died, but but he's he's buried. And you know, and and, and Kiss fans need to know, Blue Oyster Cult's part of history. Yeah. Oh. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, we as Kiss fans, we always joke about it's Cheap Trick and Kiss, Cheap Trick and Kiss. But, you know, there's Cheap Trick and Blue Oyster Cult and Bob Seger. There's a few bands and Rush, obviously, that are just, I mean, you've got to check them out because they are part of history, whether they shared stages, you know, Kiss. Shared stages, no, yeah. No, 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 Kiss was notorious. I mean, they opened. One of their first shows, they open for Blue Oyster Cult, and then a year later, Blue Oyster Cult's opening for Kiss. Exactly. You know, exactly. and it goes way back to the beginnings. Exactly, so, yeah. Um, yeah. And the Stooges I mean, were, were, I believe there was a bill, pretty sure this is true, Kiss, Blue Oyster Cult, and the Stooges. That is true. Because yeah. Gene walks out and he's like, motherfucker, that guy's got a swastika on his arm. The, yeah. like the bass yeah, player yeah, from yeah, the, right. Uh, you know, yeah. he's like, "What the fuck did we get ourselves into?" You know. Yeah. I mean? <laughs> so, um, I yeah. think that was here. I think it was in. Uh, it was uh, at the Academy of Music on 14th Street in New York. Oh, there there you go. Okay. Yep. And I know it because I got, my wife was a photographer. Uh, she's an artist and photographer. Ronnie Hoffman. RonnieHoffman.com. Great. You'll enjoy the photos, kids. Uh, but um, she uh, was contacted oh, a year or so ago about this guy was writing a story about that concert. And, um, and there's no recordings of it, unfortunately. And so he was trying to kind of recreate it in Astoria and contacted her for photos. Did she have photos? And she, she had some of the s photos of the Stooges and, and Blue Oyster Cult. I don't think she had kiss photos. I don't know. There's a really cool picture of Gene from early on 74. And it's cool because the BOC flag is behind him. Yeah, the kiss yeah. logo they put on the stage. Yeah. You know what, Mike, for this show, I'll, I'll see if I can dig that picture out. Cause that'd be a cool picture for this, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's in our, the book. Our, you know what I mean? thumbnail. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah, sure. So I mean, long. yeah. I mean, you, as a kiss fan, you gotta, you've got to give some respect to Blue Oyster Cult. Go out. If you're not a fan, go out and check out some of their yeah. albums. Just yeah. go to Spotify and hit the most popular tunes. You're going to all of a sudden go, wow, I remember that song. I remember that song. I remember that song. I mean, right. it be, I, I think for a lot of people, BOC is that type of band where you're like, I don't really know them. But then when you start listening, you're like, holy crap, I know a lot of their music. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Um, and and they you know they they did have a hit, so and it was oh, yeah a little, a little bit. I mean, that, that matter of fact, uh, SNL did an entire th skit on it. That that, re that that revived their career again. You know, just it that really SNL. Did. Hit. More cowbell. I tell you what, uh, that that song in particular has some incredible lyrics. I mean, uh, I, I you know the those songs are, are yeah, those are Donald uh, Buck Dharma's lyrics. Yes, he wrote the whole. So matter of fact, on one of the. I, again, I'm crazy collector. Uh, the original demo that he did is almost exactly 
you know, they didn't change much when they went into the studio. They're absolutely Don. He came in with the whole fucking song, which you know, you know normally the band will pick, part, especially a band like Blue Oyster Cult. They, you know, they, they it was such a conglomeration sort of. And that was another thing, you know, Sandy. Here it is, their managers writing all these lyrics. Also, for the you guys who don't, Patty Smith, yes, that Patty yeah. Smith wrote uh, wrote quite a bit of uh, of their lyrics too. Um, again, yeah, they're just a fair. fascinating band. By the way, did you see did you see Martin Popoff's new book on Blue Oyster Cult? I saw that he released one. I haven't. Oh, you got to get it. It's yeah, if you're. It's a, uh, you know what? Uh, I will make sure that you, I get you. Uh, uh, it's uh, he did a photo book on them. It's insane. I just got it like a couple hmm. months ago. Huh. Maybe I'll, so I'll, I'll buy it. I'll, make, I'll, make make the introduction. Oh, yeah, you definitely got to check it out. What it is? It's it's a book and it's got all, everything. The ticket stubs, concert get poster. It's it's really super in depth geeky stuff. It's oh, really cool. really cool. All right. So, you know, well, Patty. Um, um, Patty Smith, Sandy Perlman paid for Patty Smith's first recording session. You know, he was, and, and Patty Smith in her most recent book, The Year of the Monkey, where she mentions me and Ronnie Hoffman, um, she, uh, she talks about Sandy Perlman came up to her after a, a, one of her earliest poetry readings uh, when she had Lenny Kay playing guitar behind her. So it's kind of poetry and rock. And he says, you know, you really ought to, just get a band and, and, and do it right. And he pushed her to, to become an actual musician and paid for her first recording session, which didn't cost much. Uh, I forget. I think they did uh, Piss Factory or something, one of her early songs. That, and, uh, and she was also, and I forget what, at what point this happened, but she became the girlfriend of Alan Lanier, who was the keyboardist and kind of secondary guitarist and, in Blue Oyster Cult. Because who and, was... and, you know, it also, if you want to talk about Sandy Perlman, he was responsible because he was, he started managing Black Sabbath. That's um, right. And that's who put the Black and Blue tour together. And the Sabbath guys were all upset because they thought that he was, you know, he was favoring Blue Oyster Cult. And there, that's a whole story in itself, too. So, well, you know what? Sandy Perlman, uh, he didn't drink or take drugs or anything. He just, he looked like he, he looked like he sold drugs. He always wore his black hat and his black, I have his black hat was it hanging on my wall in my room. And, uh, but he, he, he asked me one, you know, and he was older than me and I, and I was good. I did, you know, I needed a job. And he said to me, uh, one night over beers, I was drinking the beers and he says, you know, you like to drink. You want to be the road manager for black Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, I do make it happen. Well, you know, like a lot of things with Sandy, it just never, never got around to it. But, but so I can't imagine if I had had that job. Imagine, oh my God. Imagine the book you'd be writing. Yeah. But you know, it was the uh, Ronnie. It was the Dio era. That was, the Dio era. Post that was early on Dio. That was having in hell. Yeah, it was post post Ozzy, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so I could have been the road manager. But you know, I'll tell you another thing. Sandy told me about the black and blue was was people. Um, Sharon Osbourne, her father. This is well yeah. known. It's it was a famous gangster in England, and. Um, so uh, when the band got mad at Sandy and thought he was dissing them for doing, having black and blue, having kind of a co-headlining tour that they wanted to be the exclusive headliners, the, the Sabbath, Sabbath did. And uh, so they went to Sharon's dad. I mean, Sharon went to her dad and said, look at these, what, what the fuck with this shit and blah, blah, blah. And Sandy told me, told my ear said that, that he was, threatened with death if he didn't back the fuck off and wow. you know, so uh he so he went about extricating himself from managing black sabbath as fast as he could and it was he was really only managing them uh, for the states uh people don't know yeah. that but uh anyways he was like he was terrified and he's and i read don's book if, if you want to read a good rock and roll book don arden's book is really really good yeah um was you know, Don Arden? He was kind of, 
Yeah, it was like the gangster type. Yeah, Don Arden. Right. Yeah. You Sharon's... know what's another great book, a, a rock and roll book, is the Tommy James book. Oh, yeah. Me, the Mob, and the Money or something. Yep. Oh, Ooh, I have to read that. Christ, I, I love that book. That book. And it, I had a next door neighbor, speaking of Joan Jett, uh, this, this guy lived next door to me, uh, Richie Cordell. And he was a, he was a producer and a songwriter. And he was, when I lived next door to him, he was on kind of hard times. And, but we, we hung out all the time. And I thought, you know, he, he was, he was a big drug taker. And, um, and he had written like co-written Money Money. And I think, uh, I think we're alone now, or was it Crystal? Blue? He co-wrote a bunch of the, and produced a bunch of Tommy James stuff. He was kind of Tommy James's producer, and uh, and then I, you know, and then I went off to California and got we lost touch, and 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 then about ten years after I knew him, uh, here comes Richie Cordell producing a song by Joan Jett called "I Love Rock and Roll." Mm. Now, not written by Joan Jett, but so he got you know. 10 or 15 years after his heyday, he got to make a comeback with the, I, I love rock and roll. And then he became kind of a darling of, of the uh, downtown punks and all that in New York. So there you go. That it, it all, it all yes. knots, knots and knits together. That's what I love about rock and roll was like, you, you just, you, you start digging in and following the family trees and this guy co-managed and knew and, all of a sudden, you see the connections between all these bands. I love that shit. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, so, Robert, we've been talking for almost two hours. Oh, shut time, up. Time, yeah, time flies. You talk too much. You talk oh, too much. Dude, I, your stories are, are freaking amazing. Um, yeah. Let's remind everybody, Loudmouth comes out. The, uh, a week from today, which it, it, it comes out on a Tuesday, October 6th. So, so but, when, you're, when you're listening to this, it is out because this show will go oh, live next Tuesday. Oh, so if you're listening to this, go <laughs> buy Loudmouth. Yeah, and it's available at all the online thing, you know, Amazon and bookshop.org. If you, if you don't like the big corporate ones, you can go to bookshop.org. It's all over the place. Publish. It'll be in bookstores everywhere. Wait, are bookstores open anymore? I don't know. I don't know. Order yeah. from your local bookstore, and, uh, and 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 you're doing a couple um, book oh, launch events. Yeah. Launch events. One on yeah. the East Coast, one on the West Coast. Now they're virtual. They're not going to be in stores, right. but you can. But they watch will them. be. They will be weird. So so the one this so on Tuesday, October sixth, is it? Has that? Is that in the past now? <laughs> um, no, no, you know, they, some, the some people could be listening to it the day before it comes out. So I'm, I'm doing okay. a thing. I, I, uh, this guy I know is Gary Wilson. He's an experimental, you know, rock musician. He played down in, in CBGB's in the day and then disappeared from, for like 20 years. And, 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 and it was Beck that resurrected him because he put out one record back in like 1977 and somehow some record collectors got a hold of it and it got to beck and i remember in the uh, beck song two turntables and a microphone he says my man gary wilson he rocks the most because he loved this gary wilson record which is a very odd record and kind of uh oh i don't know it's this is odd you'd have to listen to it and uh and and so then Gary made a comeback. Anyways, I got got to know him, got to be friends with him, and we uh, we had a record label. We still do at our at our at our ad agency. We, you know where we we're going to do all sorts of different things like movies, and we started a record label. We put out a Gary Wilson record a few years ago. Anyway, so I I I, I had originally I was going to be interviewed on on the launch event by Joel John from the Brian Jonestown Massacre, who's he's a he's a friend and he's just a funny great guy, and but he now he had to go back east and whatever. So so I called up Gary. I said, hey, would you you want to do a do an interview with me and maybe do a little music and and Gary's like, oh, I'm in, you know. So I'm. I'm pretty damn sure Gary Wilson has never interviewed anybody in his life. He doesn't really even talk much. So there, that may just give more room for me. But, uh, <laughs> and then he told me, he said, and he, you know, he was down for it. And he said, uh, and then he said, well, 
after we were all scheduled and the flyers went out, he says, you know, I, I don't have internet. And now that's Gary. Gary's the nut. <laughs> and he, you don't have internet. So, <laughs> so I spent the last week ordering internet from, you know, Com uh, San Diego internet service and all this shit, it, it, you know. So it's going to be possibly a wonderful mess. It's rock and roll, right? It's rock and roll, yeah. baby. <laughs> what would you expect? And then we're doing another one on October 14th, the East Coast launch, with uh, Craig Finn from the Hold Steady, who's uh, another friend. And when I told him my book, I told him about a year ago, my book's coming out <laughs> next year. And he was like, okay, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. Why don't we do a thing where I interview you at a bookstore? Well, we're, now we're going to do it under the auspices of a bookstore, but virtual. So, uh, um, so Craig Finn, who I, I love and I love to hold steady and he's a great lyricist. And, uh, so it, that should be a little bit more dialed, but <laughs> I'm just not sure what's going to happen. with the first. <laughs> <laughs> That's the beauty of it though, isn't it? I love it. Yeah. The yeah. show must go on regardless. Check it of, out, people. Yeah, October yeah. 6th and October 14th. Yeah. And there it's, I think it's like 7 or 7:30. Uh, I'll be I'll be posting on social and <laughs> Yeah, just check out Robert Duncan on Facebook and socials. You're everywhere. Okay, I should give you back your lives. <laughs> Mark and Michael talk too much. <laughs> And where the fuck is Tommy, right? He, he, you know what? Tommy Ooh. didn't bother. Yeah, who? Yeah, he's, no, he's, he, he, he didn't even he's bother to show up. He, he said he was going to be late and then just doesn't show up. He's, he's, he's probably working on his solo album. Right? You know, he's like a lead. <laughs> well, that's like a, is, you're right. He's like a you're lead right. singer. He's got you're that totally right. Well, it's been a pleasure, guys. It's been a pleasure again, Rob. Yeah. Thank you so much. Your, your stories are, are, are amazing. <laughs> well, let's. Uh, well, I spent my life in bars telling bar stories, and I, they seem to translate the podcast. I think so. Um, well, let's, let's let's do it again in three years. You got it. Yeah. The next book. All right. All right. Thanks Thank so you. much, Robert. Okay. Thanks, okay. Robert. Man, Robert is a blast to chat with. I mean, the stories, the history. You know, I love the fact that this kind of turned into the Blue Oyster Cult podcast. In a good, in a good, in a good way, though it was a really good way. I mean, it was sharing stories. Well, he's certainly somebody that you know you meet for dinner at six, and next thing you know, it's two thirty in the morning. Exactly, like, we a half hour ago. Yep, and you you just keep running your and, gums, and and, the, and then you know what you do? Then you go out to the parking lot and you just chat by your car, and then three hours later, you're still in the parking lot as the cops come by, going, "You got to leave." You know what? I, I can picture me pulling down the bed of my pickup, sitting my fat ass on there, and then just keep talking. You know what yep. I mean? Yep. Um, yeah, you're absolutely. What a great, great guest. Um, great stories. Looking forward to reading Loudmouth. Make sure uh, you go out and grab one. And um, also, too, you know, just I love and I, his entire story is so organic. It's so natural. You know, that's what. I think why he's such an inter interesting interview and interesting person is that, you know what? He didn't go, this is what I'm going to do. He just like, he just did it. And mm -hmm. life took him all these crazy places. I just, I just love that about, uh, you know, people like that. That's just, it's funny. I, it, it goes back cause it's a kiss world. We tie everything in a kiss. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the quote where, where Gene talks about Ace. He's like, you know, for as much of a mess as Ace was at times, I do admire him in one way. And, and the interviewer says, why? He goes, the fact that he would just take chances, didn't even think of the consequences mm -hmm. of his actions. He'd just go do them because they felt, that's what he felt. And Gene says, I don't have a bit of that in me. You know, I've, I've got to question everything and make sure it's logical and blah, blah. I, I, you know, I, again, you can just buy Robert's stories. When I was 21. I'm like, fuck, I'll go work for free basically. Right. Just because I want to write. And, just going to go to know, California so. and yeah. Just to be that mobile and that really that fearless. Think about it. Exactly. You know, you go from, you know, from New York to California to Detroit to, 
oh my God, you know, at a young age, just, just pack up and leave. I, Cause I, I gotta tell you, I, I don't have, I, I would love to have that. You know, I, I like structure, you know what I mean? It's, well, I, I wish I know, had a little more of that, 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 that structure especially comes as you get older because it, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's fearless. And you can see this in kids. Kids have no fear of anything. But as they start getting older and older and older, more fear comes in. And then they start questioning, should I jump off the top of the monkey bars you know, without somebody to catch me? Should I, should I swing and let go while I fly? You know, when you're a kid, you didn't care. And as adults, we're the same way. As you get older and older, you're like, well, what's the consequence of this? Should I do it? There's some people like Ace who are just like, just going to do it. Just not thinking, just go, do, live. And don't get me wrong. Sometimes that can be a, most times that can be a horrible oh, yeah. way to do things, you know. Um, but there's a part of me that, you know, we go, well, that's pretty brave. You know, I, I think, uh, you know what, just as a business owner and a father and a, you know, just, you know, you gotta make sure the bills are paid. I, yeah. I never had that kind of fuck it. I'm 21. I'm just going to go to California and see what happens without a job without, I don't think, I, I don't think that's in me. Unfortunately, well, unfortunately or unfortunately it depends. I mean, I'm doing yeah, all I, right. I, I know <laughs> I, I could have, I, I remember when I was, back in college and I wanted to get into the music industry and clearly the music industry was in Los Angeles and I'm in Minnesota and it's like I had plenty of people who are like yeah if you come on out here we'll get you a free internship working for the record label I couldn't do that because I I had to have at least the security of knowing I got some income yes. how, could I, how, how could I just pack up leave Minnesota now, granted, I could have. I got a car, so I could have driven all the way out there. But where would I stay? What would I use to buy food? Great, I've got a free job, but that's not putting money in my pocket. I couldn't do that. I, well, yeah. what did Robert say? Oh, fuck. All right, so I'm basically making no money, but the record companies have these buffets and free drink. Who can depend on that? You I know. know. Oh well, I mean, I, you know, as I said, I had a friend who had a paying job for MCA Records as the A&R rep, and he was surviving because he was taking freebies and selling them. I mean, that's what he had to do on top of his job. So it's like... Is his oh, name is he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so anyway, yeah, home, homework. Um... You know, were you a cream cream fan? Did you did you grow up reading Cream magazine? Um, do you have Robert's uh, Kiss book? What do you think of it? And uh, what do you think of Loudmouth? You got to go buy a copy of Loudmouth. It's not just Kiss. Kiss is in there. It's everything we talked about. It's basically Robert took his life and wrote a fictionalized story about it all sorts of the Detroit rock, the cream rock, everything. I mean, it's just filled with stories. So if you love that type of book, Loudmouth is going to be perfect. Um, so you know where to go. Facebook.com, Three Sides of the Coin. We're on Instagram, Twitter, everywhere else. Leave your uh, homework answer there. Um, let's see. Anything we need to plug at the last minute here? Ace Fraley's album's out. Make sure you got Origins Volume 2. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's about it. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube, the follow button on Spotify, and leave a review and a rating and subscribe on iTunes. That's it. Three sides of the coin. We're out of here. Till next Ooh. week. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.
so you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.